Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. So we all know about microservices, right? And when we think of microservices, we usually picture it as there will be a gateway, there will be multiple microservices that are running and the client will be interacting with the gateway and from gateway, different requests will be routed to different microservices and response will be gathered and given back to the client. So that is just one design pattern that is known as the API gateway pattern for microservices. Just like this API gateway microservice pattern, we don't have only just one pattern like this. We have around six to seven type of microservices pattern. So in today's video, we are going to deep dive into six to seven type of microservices design pattern which is an you know, essential topic for all the system architects, software engineers, then anyone who is trying to building a scalable or distributed systems, right? So this is quite important for you to understand about this uh, microservices pattern because just understanding or sticking to one won't help in all the scenarios, okay? When you're, when you're designing a distributed system. So we'll first understand what, what are these pattern, how they function, when to use those and what are the challenges in that particular pattern. Understand all these with real life examples. So let's dive in. So we'll know about microservices. Microservices, if just in a brief, I'll tell you microservices is used to, you know, create different independent services so that they can function independently and make scaling the entire system easier, right? So let's say you have order microservice and you have payment microservices and you have a profile management or feed management microservice. So you know you, your application is getting a lot of orders so you can easily scale the order microservices loan along with the payment microservice without touching the profile or you know home screen or feed management microservices so that's the cool part of having microservices architecture in place the first pattern that we're going to discuss today is the database per service database per service pattern all right so now what is a database per service pattern now in in this pattern each microservices has its own dedicated database which ensures the services function autonomously, right? And how does it work? Basically, if we think about how does it work, each service maintains its own database instance and services interact only with their respect, uh, respective databases, not any other databases. Data across multiple services or multiple databases shared uh, via APIs or events to the client. Now let's just think when to use this kind of database per service pattern. When your services need to scale independently and you know that there is no dependency between a micro particular microservice and a microservice B, you can go for this pattern. And when different databases are optimized for different uh, workloads, let's say uh, one database could be a NoSQL based database and another could be SQL based database and bo both of your microservices are independent of each other so in that case you can go for this pattern and if you need a strict data isolation you must go for database per service pattern while designing your microservices architecture now some of the challenges that you will face while maintaining this or implementing this uh, pattern right the main challenge will come when you are you are required to handle distributed transactions let's say there are some data that is shared between two databases and a transaction that comes or request that comes from the client requires you to query multiple uh, databases nodes at the same time in a distributed manner so in, the, in those cases land into some sort of problem and the next issue is the data consistency across services can be complex various giant e-commerce applications like amazon flipkart etc right they use separate databases for orders inventory management payments which ensures the independent scaling and data isolation as well now the next type of pattern microservices pattern we have the second one is the api gateway pattern this is what i talked about in the beginning of the video this is what we usually implement and usually follow and this is a most commonly used microservices pattern so in this pattern we have a single entry point that routes the client request to the appropriate microservices right and client sets all the requests to the api gateway and this is how it works actually now let's just discuss how it works the client sends all the requests to the api gateway uh, to the api gateway instead of calling the microservices directly and the gateway then you know authenticate the request then apply the rate limiting then forward the request to the correct microservices the response from this microservices will collected back by the gateway aggregate uh, gateway will aggregate it and send back to the client this is how the api gateway pattern works now when do we use it now when a uh, client interacts with multiple services and we need a common entry point for the client we will go for this gateway pattern that's for sure and when you need to implement uh, a centralized authentication, centralized threat limiting, caching, all those cases, and then you can go for API gateway pattern. And the main thing is to, to reduce the you know, stickiness or the you know, connectivity or chattiness between 
a client and a microservices, you can go for API gateway pattern. So what are the challenges of this gateway pattern? The first challenge you'll face is that it, it will easily can become a bottleneck if it is not properly designed for scalability. You need to think about how to scale this gateway, how to think about uh, how to scale these individual uh, microservices that has to be designed in place. If I talk about the real life use cases, almost all the popular application or all the products and grid application, almost all of them use this API gateway pattern at least at some part of their product or some part of their, their entire architecture. So the third pattern we have with us is the BFA pattern. Not best known forever pattern, it's backend for frontend pattern. So as it as the word suggests, it's a backend for frontend pattern. Now what is it? In this pattern, we have a separate backend which is completely tailored to the different uh, client types. For example, web application will have a different set of backend. App will have a different set of backend. Desktop app it can have a different set of backend. And how does it work basically? Now each client app, let's say web or app, right, has its own BFF that interacts with their backend services. So web will be having its own BFF intermediary a client request will come to web bfa and then it will communicate with its required a desired a set of backend services then app bff will uh, communicate with its desired set of backend services and the bff then processes and optimizes the data that is specific to the client which will reduce the need for an extensive front front end logic for handling the data uh, because hand, data handling in web and the app can be a little bit different it cannot be 100 percent same so it, it catered to those kind of needs as well now when do you use it this bff pattern as we clearly see from the picture, when you have different clients that have unique API requirements or unique data handling logic, you can go for this pattern. And let's say you want to optimize performance for mobile and web app separately, then you can go for this pattern obviously. Some of the challenges that we face in BFA pattern is, it requires you know additional maintenance, right? Because you'll be having different kind of uh, intermediary service than different kind of microservices and some microservices which might not be used by web, but it can be used by app, right? So those are the things which requires an additional maintenance for handling multiple BFFs here. So obviously it increases the complexity and backend services as you can see from this picture. So if you talk about a real life example, Facebook uses BFA pattern for its web and app version. So that's about the BFA pattern. Now let's just move to the fourth pattern that is CQRS pattern. So this is our fourth pattern. Okay. Now in uh, CQRS, CQRS stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation. Command and Query, there are two terms. One is Command, one is Query. Command is directly coupled with the write operations. Query is directly coupled with the read operations. Now if we talk about what CQRS pattern is, so CQRS pattern, you know, it is used for splitting read and write operations into separate models to optimize database interactions. Now, how does it work? So write operations are handled by command model. As you can see, here, there will be a command model or command service which will be handling the write, oper write operations to the database there will be a separate write db and read operations will be handled by query model which retrieves the data from a separate read optimized database the database could be different it can be sql it can be another kind of database so that that's fine but there will be different services interacting with the write and read uh, database separately now you might think if we update something to the write db how does it go to the read db so that's where the change logs come into picture all the changes that has been done they will be written as change logs to the uh, log, change log file and the change logs then will be transferred to the read database all right now when do you use it now when read and write workloads have vastly different performance needs you can go for this pattern now to improve scalability in high read or write systems you can go for this pattern in event driven architecture we use this pattern now what are the challenges of this it adds a complexity by managing two data models definitely so synchronizing read and write uh, requires event sourcing as you can show here uh, as you can see here through change logs this is a little bit tricky part but this is really used what are the real life examples of this the banking application use CQRS pattern to separate the high speed write transaction and read, uh, read queries to handle this kind of uh, workloads they go for CQRS pattern all right now the fifth pattern we have is the event sourcing pattern Now in event sourcing pattern, it is basically stores the changes as a sequence of events rather than updating the state directly. Let's say you updated my profile pic, it won't be directly updated to the read database in the instant. Instead, they will be, the events will be stored in the event store. How does it work basically? Uh, the events will be stored in the event store. Then instead of modifying the database records directly, the system captures the events 
which describe the changes like for example the events could be profile creation profile pick updated phone number updated those events are stored in event store first then eventually the application will reconstruct the current state by replaying these events and then it will update the state of the databases gradually so this is basically eventual consistency requirement if you have then you can go for this what is eventual consistency i have already discussed about eventual consistency strong consistency casual consistency in my system design playlist video i'll put that in uh, linked in the I, uh, I button you can go ahead and check that video to understand about this kind of consistency patterns now when do we uh, need event sourcing pattern now you need a event sourcing pattern when a system needs immutable audit log I mean, all the change logs will be stored. They, can, they are not immutable. For system, and as I already told, for systems requiring eventually consi eventual consistency, you can go for this pattern. Now, some of the challenges of this are, you know, eventual consistency can make debugging difficult. It, it requires additional infrastructure for event storage and then processing the events to update the database state, right? So, these are some of the use cases of event, event sourcing pattern. And event sourcing pattern is also widely used in a lot of uh, cases. Let's say you update a profile picture in your Instagram. And if you check immediately in your web version, in your website, open the Instagram, the profile picture might not be visible at the instant, right? It takes some time to propagate that update. So this is where the event sourcing patterns come into picture where uh, if you update the things database state eventually after some time, that is fine to the user. It is not that much of a importance to the end user. Now the sixth pattern we have is the saga pattern, right? So in the saga pattern, it's a distributed transaction management pattern that ensures data consistency across multiple microservices. There will be multiple microservices here. As you can be understanding from the diagram itself, how it works is, a saga basically works as a sequence of steps or local transaction that where each step triggers the next step. I mean, order create event, it triggers the payment, payment that triggers the shipping event. So each step works as a sequence and manner. So if any step, at any step, a particular step fails, a compensating transaction is executed to roll back the entire process, entire, entire transaction. So a single asset is not applicable here. So if you think about Saga, there are basically two types of Saga pattern. One is choreography based Saga and the other is orchestration based Saga. So this is basically choreography based Saga pattern that I have given here. So order, order service creates order, uh, order create events. Order create events is consumed by payment services. Once orders are created, it will trigger a payment process event. Once payment is processed, payment process event will be set to the shipping service. Shipping service and then will create a shipping event. Then shipping event will uh, finally complete the order. Now when do we use this saga pattern? We need saga pattern where transactions happen across multiple microservices as you can see here. So in a financial application or e-commerce application, order processing and booking system etc. All those follow the saga pattern basically. Now what are the challenges of this? The challenges of this are you know managing compensating transaction can be complex. If payment process fails you need to undo the order create event or market is failed. If shipping fails for some reason you might you know need to cancel the order you might need to refund the deducted amount and you might need to change the status of the order or cancel the order so a lot of compensatory transaction handling it becomes a little bit complex so debugging and monitoring saga requires also specialized tooling in this case one of the real life book use cases of saga pattern are in a travel booking system a saga ensures that a flight hotel car rent, rental etc all the booking are done in a sequential manner with support of rollbacks of compensating transaction as we discussed now the last and final pattern we have is the sidecar pattern. So I have discussed in detail about sidecar pattern in my previous video where I have discussed uh, about this topic. I will put that link in the i button. You can understand about sidecar pattern and its advantages in more detail. So I will suggest you to watch that video. So sidecar is nothing but just it runs as a separate process uh, alongside thin separate process alongside your main application or main service. So you can understand about sidecar pattern in that video. So I hope you understood a lot of things in different kind of uh, microservices design patterns in this uh, in this video if you understood something and if you got to learn something about please drop a like and uh, please subscribe to my channel uh, we are targeting to reach 3000 subscribers by the end of this one so keep supporting if you have any questions around uh, whatever we discussed in this video you can uh, discuss in the comment section okay so thank you for watching this video and i'll see you in the next one thank you